Hello, and welcome to Implementing Agile Configuration Management, the first seven things you need to consider. What this really means is we have to define the use case for how we're going to use source code management tools, and frankly, I find this is something that people very often forget to really put a strong focus on, and, and that's really unfortunate. When I'm working with a team and trying to help them use source code management effectively, I develop a use, usage paradigm for the developers, and I incorporate that into a full training program. I find too often people kind of throw the source code management tools to the developers and are, you know, developers by nature are very smart people, they're really hardworking, but you don't want to have people each deciding to use these tools differently. You want to define a clear usage paradigm, provide proper training and support, and that's an, a very important investment in productivity to help your team be more effective. Otherwise, I want to suggest to you that you run the risk of each developer using whatever he did on the last project. And that's not such a good thing. Because while each of those developers might have had very effective processes, when you put them all together, you can have developers doing different things that can impact each other. So remember, with source code management, you want to define an effective way to work, really give your developers some powerful tools to use these the, these techniques properly and then train them. Frankly, the risk that you run into, and unfortunately I have seen this, usually people call me right after something bad happens, you have the danger of losing code if you're not using source code management effectively. And that's one of the reasons why I always tell people there's a lot more to source code management than just version control. It's really using source code management to help your entire development process. So here's some examples. One example is we can organize the code into components. So this means you can use your source code management tool to structure the code that you're developing. That's also effective use of streams and branches, reducing the cognitive complexity of the work that you're having your developers do by using the source code management tool more effectively. You know, in my book, I have a chapter on architecture. One of the things that I focus on is that using source code management effectively helps you develop a better software architecture. It helps you get your mind around what you're trying to build, and at the same time, architecture, if you explain that to your CM team, helps them develop tools that can do a better job as well. So there's a real reciprocal relationship there. Now, one of the things you want to remember to do is to make merging viable and traceable. Now, again, before all of you sort of say, oh, we can do that, I want to challenge you because I go into lots of organizations where merging is really a problem. The developers have trouble merging effectively. It's confusing to them. There's a lack of training in how to do merging. It ends up taking people a lot more time than is necessary and then after they've merged some code, it's very hard to go back and see exactly what they did. So there's a lack of traceability. So you want to make sure that you can also navigate through your entire repository. There's lots of metadata in any source code management repository, especially if you're using a workflow automation tool, and you should, to track tasks and associate them with change sets. So what I'm pointing out here is you've got all this great data, all this metadata in your source code repository. That may include comments that uh, folks are putting in as they're committing their code in. That may include uh, just other types of uh, information associating change sets with tasks. You want to be able to navigate the metadata in your repository, and that's a gold mine of information that really helps you be able to develop more effectively. Now in an agile context, this actually takes a much greater role because we're looking to do things lightweight and we don't want to have a lot of process around what we're doing, but at the end of the day, sometimes we've got to go back and see exactly whether or not some changes got in there, who put them in, when they were put in, and were they tested. So being able to navigate your repository and the metadata in Agile CM is actually very, very important. 
just a couple more examples. We want to trace the evolution of configuration items. Remember that crazy term I mentioned at the very beginning, status accounting? I always joke with my colleagues on the standards boards that this term is so difficult to understand. Status accounting, what am I doing? Adding up some numbers and seeing if I've got a profit or a loss? No, status accounting is following the evolution of the configuration item throughout the entire life cycle. Now some folks also talk about using metrics and that's very appropriate, that's absolutely correct. But status accounting is really your ALM. It's your full software development life cycle that allows you to have traceability to understand exactly what you've developed from the beginning all the way through to the end. And it's important in, in approaching this that you also provide support for complex tool chains. Because a lot of times you want to integrate your source code management tool with workflow automation, but also sometimes you want to integrate it with a testing system. Uh, I've been involved with many projects where we use the test automation system and we integrated that with the source code management tools as well, both to save testing artifacts and also to make sure that we've got the information centrally located so we can tie a defect to make sure there's a test case associated with it and also to the change set that fix, fixes a particular bug. Now configuration identification is another one of those four terms that I mentioned in the beginning. That has a lot to do with using sensible naming conventions, standards for naming tags and branches, and procedures for creating what are called immutable tags. Now, let me explain what that means. Whenever you set a point in time, you've got to create a tag, or in some tools we call it a version label, and that establishes the baseline, the exact versions of each of the pieces of the code, each of the source code files and config files and documents, everything that goes into a release, that is what baselining is about. And some tools that are out there, uh, if, you're not, if you haven't configured them correctly, you can actually change code on the tag, uh, and, and that's not what's intended. So the tag itself has to be immutable. Once you've used it to identify a particular baseline of the code, no one should be able to delete that tag. So it's very important for tags that set a baseline to be immutable. You also want to have good standards for branching. I find a lot of times developers get real confused with how they're handling branching and it's very important to set some corporate standards for when you're going to branch and how you're going to use branching. So the most common form of branching that makes a lot of sense is to branch off of a baseline. So you would do that if you're working on some new stuff and you're, you're getting ready for the next release of your code and the phone rings and you have to do a quick bug fix to a release that's in production. Then you create a branch off of the tag that represents that production release and this way you can make a two-line fix without any chance of your code regressing due to the wrong version of a header file or some other dependency. So being able to use effective branching techniques and having good standards for naming those branches, that's an important aspect of what we have to do today. And we also need version IDs in the configuration items themselves, and we'll discuss that a little bit more in the build engineering section. So we talked about source code management, and I hope that I've explained that source code management is a little more to it than just uh, check in and check out, a little more to it than version control, and it's really essential for you to scope that out well in an agile CM environment. We'll build and release engineering. We want to support rapid iterative development. We want to be able to build and package our code fast. We want to be able to make that something that is really effective. And we want to have an independent automated build. Now sometimes that's not always possible to have a separate CM team. And by automating the build using a separate computer account, having a fully automated build, I found some, um, some audit teams are okay, some organizations are okay and feel that they can meet their compliance uh, requirements just by having a good automated process in place that uh, has full traceability. So ideally you've got a separate build team and in some environments that is an absolute requirement and in others uh, we do it through using uh, automation. Now when we build 
all of the executables, we've got to make sure that we've got a version ID built into each configuration item. So what that means in English is, if you, blow, if you build hello.c and it becomes a hello executable, make sure you've got a stamp in there that can uniquely identify identify that version of the binary. And I got to tell you, one time I was involved with the New York Stock Exchange where I was called into a room and somebody told me that I had made a mistake and I put a couple of wrong shell scripts uh, out there and I had actually crashed the entire floor of the New York Stock Exchange uh, through my era. That's what they told me. And I was able to go upstairs and I ran a procedure that I had in place to check the version IDs and was able to say definitively that the shell scripts they had online could not have come from me. So it's very important to have version IDs built into each of your configuration items. By the way, the end result is that we found that the Unix administrators had a bug in one of their scripts and they were overwriting my code after I delivered it, and that bug was still live. So having the ability to identify all of your configuration items, having a technique for that, and we're going to talk about what's called a configuration audit in a few moments, it's really important. Build and release engineering is little more to it than just being able to compile your code. It's good to be able to have a manifest with a full bill of materials, and the use of cryptography is becoming much more popular. In Maven, for example, you can write MacSha1 or MD5, which are cryptographic hashes, and that gives you a great way to make sure nobody is tampered with a particular jar or WAR file that you're deploying. And once again, version IDs have to be immutable. Once you stamp an executable, you want to make sure that nobody can tamper with that. So part of build engineering is knowing your build tools, so a good place to start. Make sure whether you're using Ant, Maven, Make, or any other build tool, MS Build, there's a whole bunch of them that's out there. Groovy's uh, get catching some popularity. Builds should always be based upon an immutable tag or version label. So that means you want to make sure that you're always building based upon a tag that somebody's created or a version label so you can rebuild that release at any point in the future. And it's always good to have a separate build account and automate everything in components as I've already mentioned. Now I like to use build servers not just for the official build but I like to make them available to my developers so that they can have the uh, have fast builds as well. It is very important to speed up the build. You must have procedures in place for, especially for agile iterative development that make your builds as fast and efficient as possible. So building in the cloud, virtualization allows you to create a fully resourced build box. You can make the build fast, not penalize developers for building every five minutes if they want to. And builds should be logged and traceable, but make sure that you can tag interesting builds and purge any unnecessary builds. But cloud computing has definitely helped us have very powerful build servers, which is a really great capability. So you want to architect your build for configuration management. So that means you architect your application to facilitate CM. I mentioned already you want to be able to put those immutable version IDs in there. CM also helps facilitate an effective architecture. So as I mentioned before, if you've got good source code management practices in place, that helps your architecture team develop a better uh, software systems architecture and that's also part of what you have to consider when you're creating a build architecture. Overly complex builds are horrible. I've had a few times where colleagues of mine who were a whole lot smarter than me created build frameworks that were pretty fancy and in fact nobody understood what they were doing. So make sure you keep your builds is really really simple and you want to make sure that in this rapidly changing architecture that you get a heads up so that you don't